Welcome everyone to AZ Bio Peers. Um, my name is Joan Kerber Walker, and it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Evo Abraham from the University of Arizona, and he is going to take us through the wonderful world of health economics. So, with that, um, Evo, I will turn it over to you. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, appreciate really the opportunity to do this um, and also then uh, another session next month. Um, what I have in mind, first of all, um, uh, I'm gonna go or work through some basic concepts today, uh, but try to illustrate that with an example. Um, I'm focusing since most of my work is in pharmacoeconomics and it's really a very easy way of explaining key aspects of health economics. Uh, because, you know, just think of a pill, you know, so nothing complex about it, you know, just a pill or, you know, a new biological agents that need to be infused or whatever, but, you know, it, it simplifies the, the, some of the, the explanations um, and uh, clarifications. So, um, and then what I want to do then next time is um, I'll talk a little bit more about aspects of pricing, um, including going into issues of price erosion, um, and then also a big aspect, um, a very pragmatic aspect, and I'll touch on it a little bit, or I'll introduce a concept uh, today, and that has to do with convincing payers that they should be paying for uh, your new treatment, your new diagnostic device, uh, your new companion diagnostic, or, uh, or uh, uh, whatever you are trying to bring onto the market. Um, so today, the value of new treatments, and, I, and I'm going to approach it from the more classical approach. There will be some concepts that some of you may have been exposed to, and I'll elaborate upon those. Now, to put this within a larger perspective, um, you know, healthcare is a very peculiar marketplace. Um, usually, what do we consider when we talk about a consumer product? We talk about cost and then being able to sell it, right? Um, and there is some valuation aspects. Think of a car. You know, some of us are happy with a very simple car that gets us from A to B and is relatively safe and not too expensive to operate. Um, and others um, want to have a little bit more social dimension uh, to, uh, of a car, for instance. But really, we're talking about cost and is that cost commensurate with our willingness to pay. Now, in healthcare, um, we have originally the, uh, people talked, and it's uh, one of the early administrators of uh, CMS, or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, you know, uh, he introduced the notion of the iron triangle of healthcare, and that is, um, we have cost, we have quality, we want to have good services, um, but we also have an access barrier. And the access barrier is um, basically um, being able to afford something that often in healthcare exceeds the capability of an individual, an average individual, you and me, the people we know, to have access to that quality treatment because of the cost being high and basically not possible for us to afford on an individual basis. So access in a certain way then also has to do with insurance, pooling of resources, pooling of risk. And then more recently, we've also introduced once we started and I think the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, kind of formalized that, the notion of choice, that ultimately people will choose. And when I say people, it's not just the patient, it's you know, patient and clinician dyad will choose uh, or not, uh, well, will choose for a particular treatment or will not choose for that treatment. So that there are some aspects that come into play. So that it's not just once you commit to being a patient that you're gonna do whatever um, uh, is offered as options. Now, 
going over more to the upper right hand corner or side of this slide, you know, um, economics is about cost and consequence, you know, so cost comes first, and then the consequence being given the cost, what can we have, what can we purchase, but then when we think about healthcare, there is health policy and policy puts cost somewhere else. It puts cost to the right and focuses on the demand. It tries to estimate the demands and what that demand will cost, irregardless of whether we have the money for it. And then we're healthcare markets. This is not certainly not in the US. It's not a single payer system. It is, uh, it is a highly regulated um, uh, industry healthcare. If you look at aspects of quality control and so on, but in market, it's about supply and what is the price of that supply or at what price can price point can we uh, set that supply? And then ultimately, when we talk about healthcare, we talk to clinicians, it's about needs. When we talk to patients, it's about needs and then the costs associated with that. So moving over to the lower left corner, you know, and this is taken from uh, uh, my Drummond's book, which is probably, it's not the easiest read, but uh, the, the best one around in my opinion. You know, it's why do we do economic evaluation in healthcare? Because we have scarce resources and we have to make decisions. Now you could say, well, are the resources really that scarce? Yes, they are scarce, because there is a cost constraint um, uh, attached to it. So if we then want to do economic evaluation, it's that cost consequence uh, alter set of alternatives that we want to evaluate systematically. Uh, we want to do that from different perspectives. It is about orders of magnitude. So this is not healthcare accounting, obviously that plays somewhere a role, but it is really estimating by order of magnitude what these cost consequences alternatives are so that we can have accountable decision making, explicit and accountable decision making. Now, when you look at some um, analyses, um, whether it's pharmacodynamic analyses, whether it's in diagnostics, in other areas of healthcare, we can approach it from four perspectives. Um, the one that prevails the most is from a payer perspective. Yeah. Either the payer wants to decide whether they want to cover something or want to cover it under certain conditions and escalating conditions. You know, we have different levels in our health insurance plans, um, but it may also be from a provider perspective. You know, Banner, for instance, has its p and committee, pharmacy and therapeutics committee, um, system-wide as well as different institutions. Really, they want to figure out, you know, is this worth it for us? You know, do we need to add this new treatment given other treatments that are available? There is a patient perspective, and the patient perspective comes in also in terms of rationalizing any uh, rationing. Copay. Copay is a form of rationing. And then the one that um, they, they use a lot in Europe is a societal perspective. And that is, uh, it's not just whether, uh, let's say, the UK, the National Health Service will pay for something. Um, there it is evaluated within a larger, much larger context. Uh, of other parameters as well, productivity, psychological and patient-centric well-being. Now, what I want to do in the next slides here is by you know, giving you uh, um, 30,000 feet overview of the different types of analysis that are part of quote unquote classical pharmacoeconomics, health economics. And I'm going to do that uh, in hopefully a pretty standardized format uh, by asking some questions or throwing out some questions. And then in the upper right hand corner of each slide, you will see what are the inputs. So if we're going to do a particular type of analysis, what are we putting into it? And then 
after we process it, what is the, out, uh, the outcome? So the first question really is we need to have an understanding of what a particular illness costs. Um, this is, if you read the literature, kind of, um, it, it feeds into the first paragraph of many articles, you know. Uh, this disease is a really bad disease and it costs us X billion a year in the US, for instance. Well, we have all seen these types of um, uh, in, uh, introductory paragraphs. But the important thing is here is that we try to aggregate costs that are associated with a particular illness so that then that's the inputs, the outputs are that we have a cost of illness, a burden of illness type of uh, assessments. Uh, these um, things, uh, these types of analyses are also important from a regulatory point of view. Um, we do need to have estimates. We do need to feed to regulators. And in a certain way, CMS is not only a payer, it's also a regulator. Um, uh, it, information about the anticipated cost or the experienced uh, cost of, uh, of a particular illness. So it's the cost of a disease or condition. And the exercise is really, what is the disease? What are the treatment options? What is the epidemiology, including mortality and disability? How does it affect productivity also? And um, important in this cost of illness, we only consider um, the illness. We don't consider any the associated costs. We don't consider any clinical outcome. So it's not about, and now if with this cost of illness, I do treatment X versus treatment Y, am I going to pay more or less and how much am I going to get? That is for subsequent uh, questions. And then, you know, in some economics books, you will read, well, you know, cost of illness is not really uh, health economics because there's one definition in economics, we always need to be comparing according to some. Well, I kind of disagree with, we, we first with a cost of illness study want to get a hold of uh, what we're trying to address from an economic point of view. This then kind of leads to the next question, and it is, now that we know how much an illness costs, the other question is, how much does a treatment cost? And this is where we get to budget impact analysis. Like cost of illness, budget impact analysis uh, among the more hoity-toity, more academic health economists is, that's not really economic analysis. It's actually a very important part because without a budget impact analysis, you're not gonna be able to sell your product. If you cannot demonstrate what the impact would be on a budget, um, it's not going to, to be covered. It's actually one of the first things that payers do internally in-house. Uh, it's one of the first analyses that uh, pharma and device companies uh, um, do or commission um, because they will be asked that question. So the inputs are the costs of the treatments, cost estimates, administration of the treatments, um, the patient mix and the treatment mix. And these are important aspects. So we're, we're trying to figure out out of a population uh, of potential patients um, with a disease, with some variants of the disease, and already a treatment mix in place. For instance, there is treatment A and treatment B uh, already available to patients, already covered by a payer. Um, you know, what is it now going to be the impact of adding a new treatment C to, to the treatment mix. So then we have in terms of outputs, the cost of treatment, cost projections, budget mix, and then uh, ultimately the budget impact. Concept, financial consequences of introducing a new treatment, forecasting costs under different use rates within the treatment mix. So this is where uh, you will demonstrate and make a point for market share, for instance. You know, in the beginning, my first year, I think I'm going to have 10%, and then it's going to accrue. 
and this will be at the expense of the other treatments uh, in the mix. Um, how does that um, affect then our budgets? Ultimately, budget impact analysis answers the question of affordability. Can we afford this? And it, it is very important, whether you are in a multi-payer system or in a single-payer system, because everyone who intends or is considering paying uh, for a new treatment will want to know, you know what is this going to cost and can I afford it? And ultimately, will I maybe pay more, but save money in other areas? For instance, less adverse events to manage. The weakness of a budget impact analysis or kind of the Achilles tendon is that it's highly assumption driven. So anyway, I'm the editor, uh, deputy editor of Journal of Medical Economics. So it's always fun to see studies that are sponsored by industry and then studies that are done independently. You know, the industry one, they will use different assumptions and try to um, gear um, using assumptions, try to um, um, point, I, I should say, uh, point the results in a certain direction that is favorable to them. Um, you can include clinical outcomes. In fact, in a good one, you will do that. That patients will be better sooner, therefore cost you less over the longer term. They may have fewer adverse events to manage. Uh, they may get to work faster, may be productive uh, again. It can be comparative or non-comparative that you just, you know, if you're the first in class, for instance, uh, with a treatment, um, you're going to be comparing yourself to either no comparative, you're just going to say, expect this to cost you this amount, but in most situations will be comparative. And then you know, it's be, it has been criticized for you know, the assumptions, inconsistent scope and quality. You know, ultimately, what are the inputs and what is the quality of the inputs that you are using? One thing that is very important is budget holder specific. It is for one budget holder. So, you know, and budget holder for the US market, that basically means a health plan offered by an insurer. And we all know that the same insurer may offer multiple health plans. So that is where uh, the affordable uh, affordability issue uh, comes in. Now, if we have established you know, uh, what an illness cost, what the budget impact will be, um, there is another step, another question that we can ask is, no, um, what is the cheapest of the options that I have? Which treatment is the cheapest? Uh, it goes under different names. Uh, it used to be called cost minimization analysis. Now you see the term cost efficiency analysis to, um, to give a more balanced perspective as opposed to just you know, downward looking. Um, the key here is of the options that I have, and especially two treatments that are equally effective and safe, which is the least costly one. Now, for those of you who are in the biopharma space, for instance, uh, this is what is driving a lot of the decisions related to biosimilars. So the quote unquote generics of the early biological agents and now getting into therapeutics as well. These are approved on the basis of equivalence studies. So we know that within statistical margins, Biosimilars, for instance, are equally effective and equally safe. And then it's a matter of identifying which one is the cheapest. Some challenges. How do we define equal effectiveness? Well, you can say clinical trials showed that the second treatment it falls within a certain equivalence margin or non-inferiority, exceeds a non-inferiority 
uh, margin. The question is also, you know, ultimately, a lot of pharmacoeconomic analyses of new treatments are done when there's no real world evidence about these treatments. We only have trial data. So we only have data based on what I always say, perfectly ill patients treated by perfect clinicians in perfect settings. And that's an exaggeration a little bit, but a trial is a very narrow slice of the population. You're not gonna have too many old people in there. You're not gonna have kids in there. Uh, you're not gonna have people with lots of comorbidities. So we have these perfectly ill patients. So the question there really is, you know, um, do we do a cost efficiency analysis once or do we do it twice or well, repeat it in the future? There's also a challenge a, a little bit that we may not have trial evidence and that we have to resort to uh, methods that are commonly referred to as indirect treatment comparisons, um, meta-analyses to kind of figure out, okay, how does this new treatment compare to one that is a standard of care? And is it really equivalent? And which one is now the cheapest? So it's not a comparison of cost treatments and outcomes, it is costs and the cost of treatments of, of treatments with uh, presumably equal outcomes. So burden of illness, budget impact, cost efficiency. There is also another um, category. You won't see it that often. It's cost consequence analysis, um, where the inputs are just, what are the costs? We line them up. What are the outputs, the outcomes? We line them up. We're not trying to make a comparison of the cost to outcome relationship. We just inventory all the costs and all the outcomes that are uh, obtained. Seldom a standalone analysis usually feeds into other analyses, but it is a good exercise to identify all relevant costs, all relevant outcomes. Um, and establish the transparency of your uh, analysis. On the other hand, you know, there's room for subjectivity uh, in the process and in the interpretation. Now we're gonna make a little bit of a jump. Um, the methods that we have discussed or that I've reviewed up to now are kind of laying the foundation. Uh, now we kind of need to start asking the question, how much more may it cost or how much less may it cost to achieve more quantity of health? And quantity of health um, is a way of saying, in terms of the outputs, we measure it in natural units. We measure it in life years. One cancer treatment, median overall survival X, new cancer treatment, median overall survival X plus, okay? So we know then, um, and expressed in life years, we can think about blood pressure. We take all of our costs plus a number of adjustments, uh, and I don't have the time to get into all of those details, but I'll illustrate it with a little bit of an example later on. Um, but it, it is about natural units. So let's say then a new cancer treatment comes out that can be added to standard of care chemotherapy regimen. Okay. Two chemotherapy agents, and now we're going to add a monoclonal antibody to it. Then the trial will be standard of care versus standard of care plus this monoclonal antibody. And really what clinicians like to focus on the most, rightfully so, is how much more survival does it provide? Progression-free survival or overall survival? So natural units, quantity, we can count it. So we compare costs and outcomes of treatments, express that in natural units, and we estimate, and I'll um, I'll illustrate that with well, the formula comes later, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. 
Now, this is where a lot of shortcuts happen in how people talk about it. But we have elements here. It's incremental. It's a ratio. So it's incremental. We talk about how much more do we have to pay. Could also be decremental, most cases, incremental. And then it's a ratio. So it's a ratio of two things. So here in a, and then the abbreviation is the ICER. Um, it's really what is the difference in costs needed to achieve a better natural outcome. And then we apply a willingness to pay threshold to, to decide whether something is uh, cost effective. This is where a lot of controversy comes in, because who determines what willingness to pay is? In fact, in the UK, there is an institute called NICE, National Institute of Clinical Health Excellence. Um, <clears throat> they do all of these health technology assessments. And if you come in below one of their two WTPs, willingness to pay thresholds, yes, you will be on the formulary for the whole National Health Service. Now they use, the higher one that they use is 30,000 pounds. Um, and as someone from Europe, the other side of the channel, you know, I can say, and before Brexit, that would have been um, about 1.6 pounds to the dollar, $50,000. That $50,000 is something that was estimated in the late 60s and was proposed as the value of one year of life, natural unit, one year of life, um, that was used in the 1972-1973 Medicare expansion into end-stage renal disease. So they, they basically said the life of a person is worth $50,000. So, and you see still in even US economic evaluations, still saying, yeah, it's cost effective at 50,000. Never been adjusted for inflation, comes out of an era of small molecule, not molecules, not complex molecules. So the issue of willingness to pay is you see this WTP, <coughs> excuse me, WTP creep happening. The more expensive the drugs are, the more lenient we become, lenient relative to 1972, in terms of our willingness to pay. Lots of controversy about it. So I wanted to uh, put that in here. Um, also, what we have when we compare two drugs, two new treatments, or no, a new treatment over an existing treatment. So we may have a better outcome and a higher cost. It may also be worse outcome and lower cost. So think about four possible combinations. One is the new treatment is cheaper and it's better. Well, that's a no-brainer. We're going to cover it. Um, it's more expensive, but better. Well, we're going to have to make decisions. It's more expensive and worse. Well, that's another no-brainer. Of course, we're not going to pay more for less. And it's cheaper, but worse. The ones in blue here, cheaper, but worse, but more expensive, but better. That's where the trade-offs come in. That's where willingness to pay comes in. You know, how much worse can we tolerate? Or how much better is really hugely better? How much more money are we willing to pay? Or is it just as acceptable? Hey, we can save here and still be relatively good. So here we talk about how much more does it cost to achieve more quantity of health? And then the economists start getting very economist-like. Um, in fact, most of them, their exposure to healthcare was as a patient themselves. Um, and my late father, who was an economist um, in Europe, um, also said, yeah, John, Economics is a science of making simple things very complex. This is what a little bit happened here. 
Um, now, economists also believe in a perfect world, which is, okay, um, that's fine. Um, the, uh, you meet reality. But they come from the perspective, there is a perfect way, and we work down from there. And we do that in a way that is sometimes a bit complex. On the other hand, what economists are very good in, in all objectivity, is to come up with metrics that you can compare across settings. For instance, if you look at macroeconomically, GDP is calculated the way the World Bank prescribes it for every country. So you can compare the GDP of one country to another country and know that the same methodology was used to estimate it. Um, Metrics of uh, unemployment and new jobs, the monthly reports that come out. These are very well established methods that can be used across settings, across times and so on. So then they um, wanted to combine this notion of a generic unit that, is, that enables us to compare a treatment in cancer to a headache, to a surgical procedure, to a monoclonal antibody in rheumatology. So this is where then, and we wanna uh, recognize that the world is not perfect. So in cost utility analysis, it is about how much more, more does it cost to achieve more quantity of health and more quality of life. Now, where does the quality of life comes in? And it is that um, they propose, it's widely used, the concept of equality, quality adjusted life here. Um, you also see a DALI, disability adjusted life here. So we try to come up with generic metrics that enable us to compare across settings, across treatments, um, across a lot of different uh, environments. And we also want to take into account that there's trade-offs in terms of impacts on everyday life. Now, we say quality adjusted life here. It's really a downward adjustment, and this is where utilities come in. So imagine a utility, well, perfect life is a utility of one. Originally, death was considered a utility of zero, but now in healthcare, we're also understanding, especially with patient choice, that death may not be the lowest on, uh, on the hierarchy. So, and it, there's a whole science uh, uh, behind estimating utilities, but the underlying principle is how far down from 1.0 perfect health, if that exists. How far down do we go to say, now this life here needs to be quality adjusted. So a quality adjusted life here is always shorter, quote unquote shorter than a regular natural life here. So it gives us a um, generic measure. We can use it across therapeutic areas. We have a similar metric as the ISER. Now it's the ISER incremental cost utility um, ratio to achieve a better generic outcome in, no, no, actually that's a typo. Um, generic quality adjusted outcome. I need to correct that, apologies. And we're also going to apply the, um, the willingness to pay uh, thresholds. All the concerns and benefits of a cost effectiveness analysis apply, but there is an issue of understanding and interpreting equality clinically. And actually, uh, a good friend of mine who's also an oncologist um, gave me the perfect line. He doesn't want his name quoted, um, but he said, I'm in the business as an oncologist of giving people on a daily basis, very bad news. And at the same moment, in the same session, the same setting, I also try to give them hope. 
So if I tell them, according to this new trial, this new treatment, you have 50% chance of living another five years. Are you then going to say, yes, but because of all the adverse events you're going to experience, because of this treatment's toxicity and so on and so on, it's only 3.2 quality adjusted life years. So it's basically saying it's not five years because throughout those five years, averaged over and then reduced, you're going to be quite miserable. So this is where clinicians then really push back uh, on, um, uh, on the use of ISURS, quality adjusted um, uh, metrics. On the other hand, for economists, it's a very helpful tool to compare uh, diseases. Then what is the monetary, I'm going to, few more traditional cost-benefit analysis, what is the monetary value of a better health outcome? I'm going to go quickly uh, over this so I can show you some snapshots of uh, cost utility, cost effectiveness, cost utility analysis. So cost-benefit analysis, costs and outcomes expressed in monetary units. So we're going to say not how many years you gain, but how much money as a way of quantifying a year you will gain. Um, you see these analyses um, done quite a bit by um, life insurance companies. Um, they want to express in today's dollars what the prospects are going into the future, especially with patients who, uh, uh, no, with, with applicants um, uh, for life insurance who have some risk factors um, uh, or prior health issues. So it all, everything that's expressed in monetary terms. Now, one more element, uh, because as you plow through the pharmacoeconomic analysis, you're gonna see some, some words popping up. There's basically two general approaches that are used the most. One is a so-called decision tree approach, and I included there an example. We all are all familiar with decision trees one, uh, one way or another, but you know, basically it's a replicative type of comparison. Uh, every branch, uh, major branch, is um, uh, propagates itself out in a similar fashion. So you're basically uh, determining if I make a choice at any branch um, or a certain event happens at any branch, how does that propagate out? So here, this was a study of patients with suspected uh, heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, very dangerous condition, um, and three possible treatments and um, how it propagates out. So that's the decision tree-based model. The other very common model is called the Markov model, um, named after famous Markov. Um, and it's also, you'll see it's referred to as um, state transition models. In a Markov model, uh, we follow patients from a beginning point to possible um, consequences later on. So let's say a cancer patient is progression-free, say a patient with refractory multiple myeloma is progression-free, may stay from week to week or month to month in that condition, but in the same week or the same month, another patient may progress um, or they may die. And we estimate the probabilities of all of that. And based upon that, then we do our uh, cost-effectiveness analysis. And then, uh, some people really uh, take on big challenges and they try to uh, integrate the two. This is uh, a graph that I uh, took out of one of our studies where we looked at um, uh, what would be um, the benefit of women at age 40 knowing their BRCA uh, genetic status. So BRCA originally the breast cancer um, um, gene 
uh, and since then associated with many other cancers so that then women can make a decision as to what they want to do, chemo prevention versus reducing mastectomy, and then how does that play out in terms of subsequently developing breast cancer um, uh, and possibly even uh, dying uh, of it. So um, just wanted to uh, put those uh, three concepts in here. Uh, just in case you would be reading some things in the literature. Now, in time that is left, and I think we're, we're doing good, um, I want to walk you through um, a you know, very traditional cost effectiveness and cost utility analysis. This is in metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the disease, it's one of the most awful cancers um, if you are stage four, uh, well, and most of them are diagnosed um, late, stage three, even most stage four, so completely metastasized. Um, your life, well, one year survival following diagnosis is 5%. Um, probably you have about you patient, unfortunately, only a few months without treatments, uh, for a long time, um, it was about five, six months with gemcitabine, and then two new treatments um, uh, were evaluated in trials. And if you look at these trials, they're old. They're already 10. The other one is um, uh, with von Hoff, uh, Daniel von Hoff, uh, you know, is eight years old. Ever since then, we have not come up with any new treatments. So, <clears throat> um, fulferinox is all agents, I think it's four of them, if I remember well, all agents that are now generic. So, you would think that be cheap treatments. Um, obviously, this treatment was done in France, done very, very well. Uh, it was funded by either the EU or the French government. I, I don't remember exactly uh, because no drug company is going to sponsor that and certainly generic manufacturers don't have the money. And then you had um, around the same time, uh, you had napaclitaxel, abraxane. Um, if you have heard of Nant, the company, um, um, it's Patrick's Soon Xiong's company that developed albumin bound paclitaxel. And combine that with gemcitabine, the standard of care, you know, what, what are the results? So, what I did here, I put in the overall survival and progression free survival. Um, and you see, they're not on the same scale. I tried to get them onto the same scale. Unfortunately, uh, now the New England Journal of Medicine has standards for graphs so that you can compare them, you can really compare them visually. But for fulferinox versus gemcitabine, you see there that it has an effect, a survival effect, but you also see how uh, you know, the slope of both um, treatments that ultimately, yes, patients will die progression-free survival, which most of the time is shorter than overall survival, even shorter. Uh, the separation between the two curves uh, is less pronounced, a little bit less pronounced in um, the NAPP plus GEM, so NAPP atletaxel plus GEM trial um, uh, lower there. So <clears throat> the question now is, you know, um, is it worth the additional, we presume additional money um, of using a branded product, a Braxane, Napat, Taxel, with a generic or have a mixture of generic agents. These curves are important because, and I talked about transition probabilities, we can digitize a curve unless we have the raw data, but seldom have them. We can digitize that and say from week to week, we can estimate the probability of someone 
being um, either surviving in general or surviving without disease progression. So we can estimate, we can develop a mathematical model of chaining probabilities that will tell us, you know, the probability of being alive or progression free at um, a given time point. Now, challenge is that um, uh, we have a relatively simple model here. Uh, and why is that a challenge? Is that it's going to be a little bit cruder. Uh, now, in cancer, a lot of things are really focused on a crude measure of, uh, of survival. But, you know, it's the figure you saw a little bit earlier. We start out with patients who are progression free. They have metastasized, but it has not gotten worse. And they can stay in that state or week to week, that whole sample then represented by a curve that we have digitized. We know that some people will progress and some people may even die. Once they have progressed, they may stay in that state and then uh, die. We look at chemotherapy costs, supportive care, medication, medication administration, clinical utilities, and then ethical and social implications that we try to uh, incorporate a little bit as well. And there you see life years and qualities. Now, one challenge, if because really what it is, is SNAP P plus gem cheaper and better cheaper and worse, more expensive and better, more expensive and worse than full Ferronox. But we don't have a trial. We don't have a head-to-head -head trial of NAP plus gem against full Ferronox. So there is, um, well, for the last 20 years, uh, thereabouts, um, we have developed a number of methods for indirect treatment comparison. And this is a very simple example. Uh, and Bucher is a, an epidemiologist or biostatistician at the University of Basel in Switzerland, and he developed this method for indirect comparison. In the meanwhile, if you've heard about network meta-analysis, this is kind of like the, uh, the, yeah, the precursor to, to network meta-analysis. But the reasoning here is actually pretty simple. We know the von Hoff trial, had GEM as a comparator, full Fairnox had GEM as a comparator. So now we can apply this method, and I'm not going to go into detail, to simulate a trial of these two treatments. Right? I had to simulate it head to head trial. But what's interesting is that we found that progression free survival full Fairnox had a bit of an advantage, a statistical advantage over NAP plus GEM. But in terms of overall survival, that is not the case. Now, if you go to the guidelines and CCN guidelines, they are saying the patient is strong enough because fulfurinox is a lot more toxic. Um, put them on fulfurinox. Uh, it's debatable, but um, at least now we have metrics, hazard ratios, and their confidence interval that we can use in our uh, economic evaluation. I talked about adverse events. So we looked at the two trials and we pooled the adverse event rates. Um, and that because neutropenia and especially febrile neutropenia, it's not that high a rate, but the cost of managing febrile neutropenia, it's usually hospitalization, uh, is over $30,000. Uh, thrombocytopenia right now runs at about 40 2000 um, to manage just thrombocytopenia. And all the other ones um, um, are, you know, impact quality of life, certainly anemia, general fatigue. So all of these adverse events now are going to suppress our quality of life. So they have a utility associated with it that we're going to apply to our natural unit, life years, and come up with a composite. So what you see in this table, this one of these traditional tables, 
we specify also necessary for uh, transparency, a whole lot of inputs. Um, and we start, if you can see my cursor with all of the agents. Now, NAP backlit taxol has only one price, but all of these other agents are now generic. So you can go to websites and pull down the costs. And if you can get gemcitabine from one manufacturer for a little bit more, a little bit less, uh, ultimately then what we do is we determine the mean and the standard deviation. And the standard deviation tells us, and that will come back, the uncertainty in our estimate. Here, for napaclet taxol, we're totally certain. Um, it is treatment, oh, yeah, the, for one milligram, but then you need to multiply it by the required dose, $12 and 40, well, 12 and a bit. Um, there's no uncertainty, there's only one price. For the generics, there's uncertainty. And we need to incorporate that uncertainty in our analyses later on. We look at administration costs. We have it here. Now there, you know, the standard is you go to the Medicare CPT codes and pull those down. Um, it may vary from payer to payer, but payers are not going to tell you, um, you know, what they cover in their various contracts. So we have to treat it, CMS, it's one price, um, as something with no known uncertainty. And then we have our costs of managing um, uh, certain uh, uh, conditions here. Um, uh, this is neutropenia, febrile neutropenia, you see is a lot more. Uh, thrombocytopenia, actually, if it's a very short term management, which is basically give patients platelets, um, platelet transfusion or red blood cell transfusion, it takes care of, of that. But also, there is uncertainty about uh, around that. Here we have our utilities now. So if you're progression in progression-free survival with metastatic cancer, basically your life year that you may gain is reduced uh, by 28%. You're penalized, literally you're penalized for having metastatic uh, pancreatic cancer. So your deviation from perfect life is not one anymore. Well, it's now by 28. And then we made it quality adjusted life years. If you have survival with disease progression, it's even lower. But then we have also disutility. So these are the utilities. You can look these up. Um, uh, there's some websites that inventory them. Um, so we're going to now really adjust, first of all, a life year based upon progression free or um, uh, survival with disease progression. And then we're going to lower it even more with disutilities that we subtract from the 0.72. So we add them actually to the already 28% uh, percent reduction to ultimately come up with the overall estimate of how much quality you have left. Some other elements there, I've already alluded to it. So yeah, this utility is a spillover effect in economic terms. We discount also because we want to express it in present value, but let's now quickly compare and contrast life year and quality adjusted life year. And I'm gonna uh, analyze uh, or emphasize a few here. A life year is a year lived, good or bad, while you live it. The quality is not a quality year lived, but an average year every year adjusted. Um, and um, qualities um, are counterintuitive. And then I already mentioned um, whether they're liked by clinicians or not. 
our incremental cost effectiveness ratio is cost one minus cost two divided, I said it was a ratio, life years one minus life years two. And we do the same for the qualities. And let's now look at our base case analysis. Base case means the absolute numbers. And um, we estimate the total cost of full Fairnox, NAB plus GEM plus, uh, and then also GEM. And it's really surprising that full Fairnox, which is all generic agents, is so much more expensive. Um, and when we do the same analysis for Europe, it's the inverse. Um, this has to do with the fact that generics are expensive in the US. We have the quality gain, the life year gain, and we can estimate our incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So let's look at this one. It basically says we have to pay an additional $144 over the estimated lifetime of the median patients um, to gain that people as gem to gain um, about 0.18 life years um, and quality adjusted life year it's slightly higher okay then we have to decide are we willing to pay for that we can also do it for Fairnox versus GEM. And then from our indirect comparison, if we wanted to do full Fairnox, all generics in the US uh, versus NAP, sorry, this is a sensitive cursor, um, over NAPI plus GEM, it will cost us $350,000, $360,000 more and for a life year and $547,000 more, $550,000 more um, to gain a um, quality. Last slides here. No, I'm bombarding you with a lot of information. Remember the table that I showed you with our uncertainty estimates? We do something called probabilistic sensitivity analysis. These are Monte Carlo simulations. We simulate and simulate in 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 100,000 iterations, every possible value of all of these elements that have uncertainty, every possible value in every possible combination, and then come up with a probabilistic estimate. And you actually see that the probabilistic estimates are quite close to our um, base case analyses. This is our decision plane for more effective lower cost. This would be here, uh, but I only show, you know, I, I cut it at the uh, uh, upper um, two quadrants. It is the Apple mouse that is too sensitive, I guess, here. My apologies. Um, and it plots all of these iterations. So each little dot uh, or square there is one of the many, many iterations. Actually, you need to think of this as a, as a sphere. And you can turn it and look at the other colors that are represented here. This will help us then make ultimately make the decisions. So I, I see time is up. Uh, maybe I crammed in a little bit too much. Um, um, I have a little bit more time before I have to go teach, but um, anyone who wants to stay on a little bit longer, I'd be glad to answer questions. Terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. This was just a wonderful, wonderful session. We're getting lots of compliments coming through in oh, the chat. Um, and I want to uh, make sure that everyone has marked their calendars for part two of Health Economics with Dr. Abraham. Um, and also um, make sure that you have seen in the chat or under on the AZ Bio events page, the Flynn Bioscience Entrepreneurship Conference is 
on the 23rd. That's this week. And then Arizona Bioscience Week kicks off on October 3rd um, with lots of wonderful events, including the Drug Development Conference hosted by the University of Arizona. Um, now, um, quick questions that have popped up in the chat. Yeah. Um, and one has to do with diagnostics. As you know, diagnostics, are, we've, we've got a high concentration of diagnostics here. Um, how do we, does a diagnostic get looked at as opposed to a drug? Well, uh, with diagnostics, um, the incremental benefit that you're aiming for is um, better and faster diagnosis. So let's assume that you have a new um, way of doing MRI or something like that. So the question with diagnostics is, if I use or I provide a banner, for instance, you know, if I use an MRI to diagnose a disease versus another method, and I'm oversimplifying here, obviously MRI costs more, I can charge more, but where, am I going to ultimately come out ahead by spending more upfront and being able to treat a patient sooner or get a patient discharged sooner and yeah, um, might be helpful based upon what my contracted price is. So ultimately, you know, whether we're talking diagnostics, whether we're talking uh, treatments, um, whether we're talking combinations of the two, you know, ultimately we always need to be able to quantify it in some kind of outcome. So if a better and more expensive method also leads to relative savings somewhere else, you may come out with a very attractive uh, proposition. And then there was another one. Um, do you think that US payers uh, look at the CEA or value versus just cost plus? The, the, the first thing is um, budget impact, okay? Um, and um, that's a major driver. Uh, and you know, we don't have a public um, HDA Health Technology Assessment Agency uh, like NICE in the UK. Uh, and I'm not advocating for having one. We, we have a bit of a knockoff that is trying to get off the ground. It's called ICER, Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. Um, which also adopts a very classical, if not overly uh, classical approach. Um, and um, the, the reality is um, industry and payers are doing the analyses in-house um, um, because they, they're trying to anticipate what, what is coming. Um, so, I know United Healthcare is its whole optum enterprise. You know, part of that is outward facing, part of it is just an enormous machine internally. Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, the Federation of Blue Cross Blue Shields, whatever their name is in Chicago, has a very large lab basically that does all of these uh, in house analyses. So, yes, they look at everything. Um, Payers are not great believers in cost utility analysis, um, but they may have to do it to be able to compare across diseases, for instance, and I use that, the, the, therefore, the generic uh, uh, measure. But yeah, a lot of analyses um, are done, um, and, uh, and they're done internally because of the whole planning cycle. And it also in, informs them about pricing. Um, so then there was a question, do you think that productivity gain loss should be included in the quality? Um, uh, it, it's not directly included in the quality, it's the perspective that you take. So productivity gain and loss are more from a societal perspective or from a patient-centric 
um, uh, perspective. Um, so yes, um, there are good reasons to to incorporate that. It, you know, you, if you have good metrics, so you know, how do we quantify um, an, an hour of or a day of work lost? Um, do we go by Bureau of Labor Statistics and pick the average amount of money that a person makes in the U.S. per hour? You know, that's where the assumptions uh, come in. Um, but you know, also think of uh, being able to return to work sooner. Um, that has uh, has a certain value. You also need to take into account caregiver costs if you really want to do. Uh, take the patient-centric or patient-environment-centric approach. Um, you know, does somebody need to take time off from work to take their parents? You know, I know that's stereotyping, but you know, we, we all have done these things or will do them at some point in time. Uh, take someone to the hospital, I, okay. Uh, for me, there's no productivity loss because I can shift it over to later at night or something like that. But how, how do we implement that in, um, uh, in our models? So yeah, good question there as well. So again, um, Dr. Abraham, thank you so much um, for this wonderful presentation. And the follow-up presentation part two will be on October the 19th, which 19th. is a Tuesday okay. at 8 a.m. So um, please, for all of our attendees, make sure you sign up. Don't forget that um, the Arizona Bioscience Week and the Flynn Bio Entrepreneurship Conference should be on your calendars. Those are both virtual events for the most part. So you can do them from the, the convenience of your home and more importantly, as we all continue to innovate together for the good of patients, we need to remember that um, economics plays a big role in the decisions that are made federally, nationally, within the insurers, and at the patient bedside. So please, please, please um, you know, take a look at some of the information that is out there. AZ Bio policy is available if anyone wants to see it. And um, in the chat, if you did not see it, there's a really interesting um, comparison that was done by Pharma um, yeah. that looks at the availability of 270 new medicines in the United States versus other countries. And the decisions and how those are implemented is all about economics. So make sure you join us next month. And again, Dr. Abraham, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Sure. Well, thank you, everybody. And we'll see each other in a few weeks. And Bye-bye. Bye-bye.